Mark one. What the hell? The Nationalist Chinese provided intelligence and espionage activities against the CCP and their allies throughout the entirety of the Laotian Civil War. The situation in Southeast Asia outside of Vietnam was Chinese nationalists in Burma and agents planted in portions of the Laotian territory. In an interesting turn of events, some of the Chinese nationalists in Burma also joined the Royal Lao Army, uh, specifically the 101st Special Battalion. But before we get into that, let's get into their aviation activities with the CIA. This ain't no real war, Vietnam shit. World War II, that's a war. This is just a military conflict. Despite Air America taking operations in covert CIA fashion in Laos, the Taiwanese military also had their share too in terms of sending individuals to pilot troops fighting over the Royal Lao, the US, uh, the Republic of Vietnam, or Thai armies into North Vietnam and Laos. The 34th Squadron of the Taiwan Air Force arrived in Saigon in November 1967. It had seven flight officers, three mechanics, and two transport planes. They provided recon, airdrops, and airborne transport operations. It was not the only squadron that provided support, and there were constant rotations with other soldiers from Taiwan. They wore civvies and told their loved ones at home that they went to train in the Ryukyu Islands for the US military instead. They essentially came in as contractors, but don't say that they are from Taiwan. Flying missions over North Vietnam and Laos, they lost around a total of 25 people, including the incident where North Vietnam stated uh, capturing 17 Taiwanese. Before we even continue with the various operations of the Taiwanese military behind the bamboo wall, we must understand the political situation in Laos. Laos, an empty country known only on the internet as land being bombed into a crater by the US Air Force, provides a conflict that is just as simple as the Vietnam conflict itself. So instead of two big factions, aka the classic communist versus not communist side fighting each other, you have not one, not two, but three factions managing power in the popular country of Laos. You have a pro not communist side working alongside a pro communist side working alongside a problem child. In fact, they had literal communist troops buying food from markets within the pro not communist side in Vientiane, while their comrades were imprisoned in the Royal Lao military buildings across the street. How convenient. You had the Patilao, who also had a lot of Soviet support and let North Vietnam take their Eastern Corridor, a strategic move I might add, in order to keep the Ho Chi Minh Trail running. The Kingdom of Laos, which had huge CIA backing, and Neutralist Laos, which constantly switches sides because it wants to be the Asian Switzerland of the world. That being said, we can understand how Taiwan got involved. Okay, I'll explain. Jason Hudson, CIA. We're here to talk about your encounter with Russians in Laos. On December 14, 1960, a Laotian general of the Royal Lao Army won power in a coup in the Battle of Vientiane, a crazy battle on its own involving Thailand, the Soviet Union, and South Vietnam. That general was General Fumi Nosovan. And right after the battle, ousted the neutralists under General Kung Le into the Plain of Jars via Soviet airlift and began an uneasy alliance with the Patit Lao. Meanwhile, remnants of the Kuomintang 93rd Army Division, fighting both the Burmese government and the Chinese Communist government, were being sanctioned by the UN and forced to be airlifted back to Taiwan. Like many great stories, many of them stayed behind, living off the land, which is known for its lucrative poppy plant fields. Ultimately, fate had it that these soldiers would cross their involvement into the Southeast Asian Holocaust by moving their trade into a four-point intersection known as the Golden Triangle, where Laos, China, Burma, and Thailand all meet up. Not waiting for any wisdom from the United States, Fumi immediately made moves to take land northwest of Laos, northwestern Laos, hoping to end the political limbo in Laos. I swear, it gets less crazier. I promise. The communist Chinese began building a series of highways in northern Laos from Mengla, Yunnan to Fongsali, Laos. When finished, they went to build Route 46 in 1966, from Yunnan to the border of Thailand. Thousands of PLA troops and 400 anti-aircraft guns moved to defend the road project. This created unease with the Thai and American forces in both Laos and Vietnam, who see this highway within neutral Laos as part of Chinese expansionism. This went up all the way to the White House. The result was a series of operations that became a series of small arms fighting between Thai soldiers slash mercs, the Royal Lao Army, 
the Chinese PLA, Patet Lao, and Communist Thai Army, as well as North Vietnamese armies, all thrown together in one blunder. Naturally, this caught the eye of the Taiwanese, who had a desire to use Paul War and intelligence to spy on the Chinese activities as a means to protect Taiwan from possible invasion and possibly further retaking the mainland one day. For the Taiwanese, this war in Vietnam, the Second Indochina War, is just another front for its inconclusive Chinese Civil War, which like the Korean War, never had a formal treaty that officially ended it. Does it make sense yet? Too bad. The Chinese CCP built these roads as a friendship highway for their Patel Lao allies. So of course, the Royal Lao were not consulted. In Phong Salai province, the neutralists that owned the territory invited the Chinese PLA to train their troops in 1965. Going back to 1962, while the CIA was doing their thing spying on the Chinese construction, Fumi moved his troops from Muangze to Luang Namta. Communist troops from either China, North Vietnam, or the Pat Lao fired mortars at the Laotian army there, giving the US military officers a Dien Bin Phu vibe with his topography. By May, Fumi sent his best soldiers along with some US Army Special Forces to train and prepare for the attack on the Pavan 316th Brigade. It's, yes, the same ones that fought in Dien Bin Phu. By December that year, they began the move out to Pak Beng Valley, where they were met with light fire by the Communist forces. It was then that the Taiwanese mercenaries under the banner of the Royal Lao Army arrived. These men were possibly from the remnant army that fled Yunnan instead of, you know, straight from Taiwan. Their name was the Special Battalion 111, led by General Li Tang. They laid down fire coming from the east flank of the hilltop and shield the U.S. Army Special Forces for five days. And on December 31st, 1962, the Americans were all extracted via helicopter to Luang Pra Bang. The rest of the Lao armies dispersed while the Taiwanese mercs went to northern Thailand and just quit the war. Huh? Fumi led another attack huh? from Ban Namo that failed, but he did not give up the defense of Luang Napa. He brought in some paratroops that added a 5,000 strong army against the enemy's 2,500 troops. In April 1963, his patrols probed for neutralists and Pat Lao forces. But the North Vietnamese had a trick up their sleeve, air supplies. More Pavan battalions arrived, adding with some Pat Tha Lao in the mix, to Muang Sing, reinforced by Soviet and Pavan airdrops. They pushed the Royalist troops back to the Mekong River and had them cross back into Thailand. This made John F. Kennedy send 5,000 American troops into northern Thailand, just in case some shit happened. The U.S. Army SF were saved, but the 2,000 Royalist Lao troops were captured by the Neutralist and Pat Tha Lao. This quickly degraded Fumi's power as his best troops were now in little numbers and most in enemy hands. This led to the actual coalition government in Laos which is just as effective as it looks. Northwest Laos was now in the communist bloc hands with the Ho Chi Minh Trail being ever more secure. They say we're trying to stop Chinese expansion but I ain't seen no Chinese since we landed. Because of the battle of Luang Nam Tha, the CIA started to believe the Chinese construction of the road to Phong Sali was in reaction to the fighting there which the road happened to be nearby. It had to be a coincidence, right? Over time, the Chinese faced technicalities building the roads into 1967, so the PLA began making more incursions to Laos, complicating the situation. The Chinese road, Route 12, was defended by 17 AA guns. In response to this gradual construction of the road, the CIA sent watch teams from Nam Yu to spy on China's activities as it continued its work into 1968. As the Kingdom of Laos lost the Battle of Nam Bak, which occurred south of the roads, it caused a fervor among the Chinese who now accumulated six companies of PLA within Laos. The work will go on, but the construction had to be halted on June 16, 1968 because Mao Zedong wanted to kill a bunch of his own countrymen for a specific period of time. Then by mid-August, 208 PLA trucks arrived, and by October, a thousand infantry accumulated, guarding the 2,000 workers on Route 4, armed with 10 bulldozers and a road roller. Meanwhile, in 1967, the communists well established in Phong Sali province since 1962, an ambitious general named Wane Ratakone had some ambitions. Luck would have it that the general had some connections to the Taiwanese military and acquired some soldiers who became contractors under the Royal Lao Army. He exploited this connection by dangling the idea to the Taiwanese military that the Laotians can provide an establishment from which to spy on Mao's China as part of a grander plan of Project National Glory. Wane's attempt in this op 
was with the help of the CIA in late 1967. A recon team was created using eight local spies, seven of which were originally from Fong Zilei, to spy on communist China. The agents were dropped by the CIA into the extreme Laos, right on the border of China. They spied for two months by the border until a commie patrol had contact with them and the agents exfiltrated via RLA H-34 helicopter. Now, using nationalist Chinese agents directly from Taiwan, Wane allowed them to set up a show in Ban Quan, Laos. The name of the intel team is lost to history, but they were eventually sent to Fong Zilei to repeat the same initiative as the first. This time, they had lost radio contact and vanished. I wonder why. A year later, in December 1969, as a way to test the Chinese, General Wane flew a C-47 over the Chinese Route 46 and was fired upon by AA guns. He tried to get the Lao King's Vatana to get Zavana Fuma to get military action. The US Ambassador Godley tried to get approval from Washington, but it was refused. The Royalists and a couple of nationalist Chinese soldiers lured from the opium trade assisted in the watch teams on these Chinese roads, especially the nationalist Chinese in their haven in Burma. In the words of a CIA analyst, they described the situation in the china thai Lao border area as a farago of regular and irregular formations combined to make Northwest Laos a political, ethnic, and military stew that defied management or even description. Wow. Overall, the CIA, RLA, and Taiwanese sent mercenaries and special forces to harass the Chinese soldiers building these series of roads into Thailand and Laos from Yunnan. The CIA alleged that these road constructions were in response to the fighting between the Pat de Lao, an ally of China at the time, and the RLA. What resulted from these firefights was photos such as this. How did this Chinese PLA soldier get a Thai HK-33? Perhaps he purchased it on Amazon Prime on discount. Oh, and did I mention opium trade in Burma? Yeah, we're not missing that for a second. I got about these veterans over there in Vietnam getting high all the time. What they were doing to get high, why they were getting it, and how cheap it was, and that kind of thing. And decided I try it out. Remember the nationalist Chinese from Taiwan that that Laotian general Wane acquired to set up in a region called Buan Khan? Yeah, right before that, there were some national Chinese there. Just not imported from Taiwan, but from the remnant army in Burma that may have started a minor opium crisis with the Lao royalists. The Burmese Shan got involved too. Following their retreat from the Civil War, the 93rd under General Li Mi stayed in Burma after the UN call out to get the Nationalist Chinese out of Burma and Thailand, right next to the Hmong in Nam Mu. These Taiwanese dominated the opium trade in Southeast Asia from a country that's not even theirs. The opium trade has been prevalent there for years as a lucrative cash crop to sustain the livelihood of the rural people there. Around September 1972, a CIA inspector general stated, opium was as much part of the agriculture infrastructure of this area as was rice, one suitable for the hills and the other suitable for the valleys. The KMT drug cartel had recoilless rifles, 50 cows, radios, crew served weapons, and 600 pack mules loaded with the tightest dope known to man and charged fucking taxes. Er, easy. You didn't pay your taxes for a couple of days now. Why don't you just relax a second, get your bearings. Let's see what the dead. They had an interesting story being a home too far, but things are about to get spicy. February 1967, a Shan Burmese warlord by the name of Kun Sa, or Chang Chifu if you're Chinese, who got his training from these Taiwanese soldiers, suddenly declared that he was entitled to the KMT transit taxes of all the drug mules moving through the Wa state in Burma. It was a declaration of war. He had his dudes gather 16 tons of opium from Wa and Kokang into Laos. He allegedly sold a record-selling 500,000 USD worth of dope to General Wane, who probably used his money to help fund his war in Laos. It's no problem, man. Let me just get some money out of my wallet. Wait a minute. I don't have any money. That the U.S. were increasingly giving him less of towards the end of the U.S. involvement in Indochina. The emphasis of the U.S. mission in Indochina went from Laos in the 1950s to South Vietnam the moment Boots stepped on the ground in Da Nang in 1965. Khun Sa sent his 800 men mule train towards Ban Quan, but not before being pursued by the KMT Chinese, who have heard it over the radio. When his men crossed the Thai-Burma border area, they ignored the toll and began to be pursued by a thousand KMT soldiers of the 3rd and 5th armies. They fought in Kentung, but the Burmese were able to drive off their attackers. By 15th July, the mule train crossed the Mekong River into Laos. 
They arrived at their meeting spot at General Wane's sawmill and began to set up defenses. A school principal witnessed the incursion and called the nearest RLA post to do something about it. Using 5D trigonometry, Wane has to plan to gain permission from Prince Savanafuma to take military actions under the guise of protecting Laos sovereignty. He was allowed to drop in paratroopers, gunboats, and T-28 airstrikes. The Taiwanese arrived to the mill on July 24, 1967 to begin negotiations with the Burmese and went nowhere. Suddenly out of nowhere, an RLA chopper arrived to announce both sides to get the hell out of Laos under orders of General Wane, which is confusing to the Burmese because he was the client, but they were told to stay secretly through radio message. The Taiwanese became impatient and demanded 2,500,000 US dollars as a price for them leaving. They were shot at because the Burmese did not agree. A battle ensued involving 50 cal 600 millimeter mortars and recordless rifles on July 29th. Then as things got better, the RLA summoned a T-28 airstrike on both sides. The RLA paratroopers marched towards the south end of the mill to block it. Another regular infantry battalion marched to the north to block that part. And on the Mekong, two patrol boats arrived to await any sort of movement. The fighting went on for two days as T-28 planes launched from Luap Ra Bang dive-bombed the mules and drug cartels. The remaining Burmese deserted towards the Mekong under fire, leaving their shipment behind and left Burma with 82 dead. The Taiwanese lost 70 men and 24 machine guns. They abandoned their mules and headed up north towards Burma, where they were blocked by the RLA grunts. Additional troops from Vientiane were also deployed to encircle the KMT. There were two accounts of what happened next, but either way, General Wane got his dope. What you're seeing is advanced warfare. The remaining KMT went north into Thailand, where they were met by the Thai army. News of the incident leaked out and put Thailand security at risk. Unknown to the world, the Thais had been letting the Chinese nationalists thrive off their land as a way to contain their own communist problems with the CPT and PLA. But now that this news broke out that they were covertly using Taiwanese troops to threaten Chinese, Laotian, and Burmese sovereignty, they had to put them in time out. In August 1967, the rest of the 3rd and 5th KMT armies were allowed back into their bases in North Thailand where their descendants still live there to this day. The result of this battle is a meme of the whole war in Laos. In the words of Ted Shackley, a CIA agent, this battle of Ban Quan was the best combined arms operation to be mounted by the Lao conventional forces during my tour in Laos. And this was against the Taiwanese and Shan Burmese drug lords, not the Pat de Lao or the NVA. Kun Sao, feeling absolutely defeated and ashamed, went on the run being chased by Thai, Laotian and Burmese government forces. Wane's product ended up going around the globe and possibly in the hands of the US troops in Vietnam. General Wane was truly a master general in the Second Indochina War. Up with General Abrams, Van Tien Dong, No Quang Dong, and Che Myung Sin. Notice how they are mostly Asian? Cause fuck you. In 1970, Prince Sihanouk the leader of Cambodia was cooed under mysterious circumstances and replaced with the least left-leaning General Luan Nu, who took wisdom for battle from a Buddhist monk. When Chiang Kai-shek found out, he immediately wanted to send troops to aid Cambodia against the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese in that country. However, because of Nixon's trek into communist China, Nixon pushed against it on Chiang in fears that it would cause China to send more troops into Vietnam like they did in Korea. However, due to America's blatant disregard for Taiwan's sovereignty in the UN as the real China, he did not give a fuck. He assigned Wang Shen, who you know was a political military advisor in Taiwan, to establish a military mission rather than an embassy in Cambodia instead. Lan No also wanted to disregard America's plea to not bring Taiwan into the Indochina question. Wang sent personnel in September 1972 to start training the Khmer Army in psychological and political warfare programs. What was taught was intel gathering, mass mobilization, sabotage, raids, and infiltration. However, it was too little too late and was not enough to deter Lan No's regime from deteriorating from within, as well as face off against an experienced enemy that wiped out 10 whole battalions of his own army of the Fank. Wang conducted his last inspection in December 1974, as the North Vietnamese gradually gave their ground to the Khmer Rouge in order to focus on South Vietnam leaving the poor Khmer's for dead. Economic collapse and worsening security conditions made the situation in Cambodia worse. In the month of the Khmer Republic's collapse, Taiwan was the last country to evacuate from its military mission in Phnom Penh. You're doing so great, keep going. You're doing such a good job just like that. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. You're 
perfect. It's great. On April 5th, 1975, as the world of Indochina quickly fell into communist hands, the leader of Taiwan, Chiang Kai-shek, dies. Many of the Taiwanese advisors began retreating towards Saigon. With the fall of Bao Mi Tut, it was a mad dash out before the capture by communists. The Taiwanese Construction Corps managed to escape. Without planes, they had to walk among the evacuees, taking fishing boats by sea to make it back into Saigon. They managed to make it back to Taiwan with only Liu Geilun and four other people staying behind until April 18th. April 15th, 1975, the Taiwanese embassy began burning documents of the 10 years of their involvement in the war into ashes, not wanting to meet the same fate of another Lao Kai abandonment like their Vien QDD counterparts. They hurriedly got the hell out of there by April 26th, 1975, conveniently just as the South Vietnamese president, Nguyen Von Tu, arrived in Taipei. With the fall of Saigon and the plight of the Bo people that went on well into the 1990s, Taiwan under Chiang Ching Kuo reacted to the newly reunified Vietnamese state with hostility by barring any relations with Vietnam. In 1987, a massacre of Viet Bo people occurred on the island of Khi Minh, perpetrated by the Taiwanese military. It was called the 1987 Li Yu Massacre that killed 19 unarmed Vietnamese Bo people, some of them of Chinese descent. Relationships between the countries would not be restored until the 1990s when Vietnam opened up. Open that shit up! Taiwan number one! Taiwan number one! Yeah. With evil dictator Lei Zuan dead, and a country in near famine due to failed economic policies, in a two-front war with Cambodia and China, the CPV decided that they had to adapt or collapse. Nguyen Von Lin, leading the charge of Doi Mui, they got rid of their cooperative farming system and allowed people to grow and sell their own shit. Vietnam CBV decided to look into how other Asian countries were thriving. They saw China's example, which was based off Singapore's example, of inviting foreign investments into their own country for better growth. One of the Asian countries that they looked at was Taiwan. With an authoritarian dictatorship removed and economic reform, and eventually democracy introduced, Taiwan became one of the four Asian tigers. Vietnam listened to all of that except the democracy part, but nevertheless, by letting other countries invest in Vietnam, Vietnam grew and became one of the fastest growing economies in Asia by 2010. By 2006, Taiwan-based investors poured in an equivalent of 8 billion US dollars into Vietnam. Oddly, in equipment and buildings for conducting labor-intensive manufacturing and export processing zones. Kind of like what happened during the war, but without the violence. This made Taiwan Vietnam's largest foreign investor. Taiwan restored their original embassy in Saigon, now a cultural economic building because China is still Vietnam's regional ally, sort of, and is now modernized and completely unrecognizable from the original building. The second one in Saigon being the Chinese CCP embassy. That's definitely not awkward. Today, both countries now exchange technology and other shit like boba tea and, uh, uh, you know, other 2010 related shit. I don't know. I don't have anything else to say, but I sure hope the future is bright and you should too. Now, here's a montage of some photos declassified of Taiwanese troops in South Vietnam. Enjoy.
Oh, oh, uh, the verdict of the CIA and Taiwanese operating in China, you ask? Uh, yeah, it's definitely internationally selfish of the U.S., but nationally selfless for protecting U.S. citizens from foreign danger by holding other countries as meat shields before they ever step foot in America. Uh, for Taiwan? Uh, it didn't really affect Taiwan too much because the U.S. was just doing most of the work for them. Uh, they were really trying to regain China back from the communists by opening all these fronts in Asia, but it was too little too late. Um, the CIA in general? Well, I, I don't know about the U.S. and South America using the CIA. Uh, I don't really know much, too much about that, other than, you know, it's just, just kind of evil from what I heard. Uh, but on behalf of Asia, it's kind of different for me. The U.S. may have done some massacres in Korea here and there, but as long as no one sees it until decades later, no one's going to question the existence of South Korea. You have Samsung, Boba T, video graphics cards, Kia, K-pop, J-pop, Squid Games, and anime, thanks to these flawed efforts. And what did we get from Vietnam? Um, I, uh, I don't know. Uh, cheap labor or something? So Operation Storm 333 was an operation committed by the Soviet Union 